viewers, special guests joining this special show. Uh, man, I'm so excited to be able to interview this individual. Six-time Pro Bowler, two-time first-team All-Pro, Pro Football Hall of Famer, Super Bowl form, uh, 40 champion, my former teammate, Jerome Bettis, the bus, joining us here, all things covered. First and foremost, JB, how's everything going with you? Man, B-Mac, thanks for having me, brother. I am I'm doing well. Uh, blessed, highly favored, man. Thank you so much for having me on the show. Uh, no doubt, no doubt. First and foremost, before we get into the grid iron, man, you play a lot of golf. You know what I mean? There's a dirty rumor floating around that you, you really, <laughs> you know, you got a nice golf game, man. But let's keep it real. How, how is the golf game going for you nowadays? You know what? Golf has is, is been really my, my sanctuary. Obviously, no football. I needed some type of release that, that kept me competitive kept my competitive juices going and then I fell in love with golf and it's kind of you competing against yourself. And so mm -hmm. me wanting to be better and better, I just kept working on it and really had the time, obviously being retired. Um, I had a lot, lot of time on my hands. So was able to put it to good use. So now the golf game is, uh, it's pretty decent. And you actually have a tournament you're participating in in the next few weeks or so, right? Yeah, I got one. Uh, I'm I'm participating in um, actually tomorrow in mm -hmm. in uh, Arizona, yep. and part of the proceeds are going to my foundation, the Bus Stops Here Foundation. So I'm glad to be a part of it, and so we'll we'll go out and play and and uh, fellowship, have a great time, but also raise some money for some important foundations. Okay, a great cause, great cause. Definitely we'll tap into a little more about the foundations and other things that you're involved in uh, towards the end of the show. But you talked about the bus stops. The bus started in LA, right? With the Los Angeles Rams and, uh, you know, coming out from Notre Dame. I was a big time fan when you played there at Notre Dame with number six uh, with the likes of uh, 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 Brooks. You had uh, 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 Tony Rice, uh, uh, some outstanding names there with the Fighting Irish. But getting Rocket, drafted, Rocket Ismail, man, some Iconic college football names, to yeah. say the least. Getting drafted in L.A. and eventually getting traded. Uh, I heard that, you know, basically the Rams gave you two choices, right, uh, to, to uh, accept the trade to. The Pittsburgh Steelers and at that time the Houston Oilers. And you decided to, to take Pittsburgh as the route for your new destination because of the tradition and the prestige. How important was that? to you at that time? And do you believe current players really look at the tradition and the prestige on where they should play, especially if a trade is involved? You know what? I don't know if it was, it was as much that it, as it was, it was more scientific as opposed to uh, it was the prestige. What I looked at was, and the prestige played, played a part of it, mm -hmm. but I looked at it from the standpoint of two organizations who like big running backs, yep. right? And so now the the next question was, how good is the current roster? Mm -hmm. and, and so that was that was the next question. One, I wanted to make sure the organization liked a big running back because I I was two forty five. I wasn't you know I wasn't a little guy. Yep. So both organization historically had big running backs, love big running backs. So the Steelers though what gave them the edge is they had just lost in the Super Bowl against the Dallas Cowboys so they had a championship caliber team that just played in the Super Bowl mm -hmm. so I'm thinking to myself if I'm gonna go to the, the best team the better team is the Steelers because they just they were just in the Super Bowl and mm -hmm. they got a chance to go right back and I was thinking hey I'm the missing piece we can go right back it took 10 years but I think I picked the right team. And what, what people have to also remember is I had a choice of the two. The, ten, the, um, the Houston Oilers was picking 15th. The Steelers were picking 31st. Yep. My, my stable mate, in terms of my agent, he had another running back that was coming out in the draft. His name was Eddie George. Eddie George. Yep. So Eddie ended up going to, so, so whichever team I picked, Eddie was going to go to the other team. Uh -huh. So I needed to make sure I picked right because I knew Eddie was going to go to the other team. My agent want, selfishly wanted me to go to Pittsburgh yeah. because Tennessee was picking, I mean, uh, Houston was picking higher. So yeah. it made sense so for him. It, it made sense for everybody, right? So no everybody was happy when I chose uh, Pittsburgh because 
uh, Eddie went on to Tennessee and had uh, well, Houston at the time and had an amazing career. He was rookie of the year when he came out. So it was uh, it all worked. Yeah, no question. No question. Quality insight there, because you you hit on something earlier in that in that conversation about both organizations loving bigger running backs. Right. They didn't get you, but they got another big frame, big, big back. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Eddie George, you nearly retired in 2004. Um, looking back on that decision, who was most responsible for you in deciding to return in 2005 for your final season? Great question, great question. So I'll tell you how it happened. Uh, obviously you being there, um, the end of the season, the year prior, we were 15 and one, we lost in the in the AFC Championship game mm-hmm. to the Patriots, came in that Monday after the game, thank all of you guys, all of my teammates for being incredible teammates and having given 100%. It wasn't a dry eye in the house, obviously. Um, but at that point, I was done. I go into coach's office after the meeting. He says, hey, don't make any rash decisions and, and just kind of think about it. And I said, well, coach, you know, I pretty much thought about it. And I'm, he said, but j- just think about it. Well, lo and behold, in the Super Bowl, Corey Dillon breaks his ribs. I was, an, I was the first alternate that year. Mm-hmm. So I go to, to the um, Pro Bowl now, Back then, the team who lost in the AFC Championship, that coaching staff went. So the Steelers coaching staff was there. Yep. We were 15-1 and one that year, so we had eight guys that got into the Pro Bowl. They brought different guys. So it was so many players that came out uh, because all the other players were, were in the game that the Steelers uh, and Mr. Rooney, they had a Steeler luau uh, <laughs> one of the nights there. I think that wins at Thursday night. At the Steeler luau, I was getting harassed by Larry Foote and Clark Hagens. Mm-hmm. And Larry told me, I'll never forget it. He said, Fussy, man, you it's gonna be a shame. We're gonna we gonna win the Super Bowl in Detroit, that hometown, and you're not gonna be there. And I was just like, whoa, wait a minute. <laughs> and then Clark was like, Man, we we were 15 and one last year. You know we got a great team. We're gonna be right back. Yeah. And I'm thinking, Ooh, you're right. <laughs> Both of you guys are right. Uh-huh. And so that got me thinking about it, went home, talked to my wife, and and that's what brought me back for another year. So those guys were instrumental. So Clark Higgins and Larry Foote basically were the catalyst in being able to get you that's to right. the vision to return in 2005. That's right. Had, had it not been for those two guys coming out uh-huh. to the Pro Bowl, I would not be a Super Bowl champion. Oh, wow. Great story. Right. Great story. And yeah. talking about, you know, being a Super Bowl champion, um, if you didn't return in 2005, would you look at your overall career as potentially being incomplete, not having that championship? You know what? That's a great question, because, you know, would it still be Hall of Fame caliber? I would still say yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it it wouldn't be complete. Because for me, um, you know, people ask me all the time, what's more important, the championship or the Hall of Fame? And I, I tell people, the Hall of Fame is a byproduct of me wanting to be a champion every year. Mm-hmm. Um, so I always raised my level and wanted to be the best version of me every season. So whether it was learning a, a spin move, learning a stiff arm, doing all these things to, to develop my game better, those are the things that I worked on because I wanted to win a championship. So had I not won a championship, but the career would have felt incomplete for me because mm-hmm. that was always my goal to win a championship. And that's why I took it so hard. Every time we lost a, a, a year and a year went by, I, I had two to three weeks where I just, just stayed in the house and, and just trying to reflect it, worked on yeah. myself to be a better person because I was always distraught after every year because of my goal was win a championship. And one thing I can say uh, about you as an individual being a team leader, especially in 2005, one thing you emphasize was togetherness and 
one quick story. You might not remember this, but this meant the world to me. My my rookie year, we were getting ready for OTAs or mini camps, and my locker was a few doors away from yours on that side. Yeah. You know what I mean? And uh-huh. I remember we just got done working out or something like that, and you looked at me and you said, "Yo, Florida State." So I thought you were talking to Chris Hope because Hope was from ah, yeah, yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. So I wasn't. I'm looking in my laundry bag, and he was like, "Florida State rookie." So when you said rookie, I looked up and I'm like, "Yo." freaking bus is talking to me right and he was like man what do you got what are you doing tonight and i was like uh shoot i'm just i'm staying at the allegheny i'm just chilling and you said well why don't you come by uh i think it was deuce daily spot because you guys were gonna have like a pork, poker game or something like that and he was yeah, like, yeah, yeah. And he's like why don't you come by deuce spot man and hang out with us so i'm like oh freak really in my mind i didn't want to have a starstruck moment but in my mind internally i'm like man this man just invited me a hall of fame a potential hall of fame invited me to come kick it with him and the other big name vets and then you said make sure you round up as many rookies as you can and have them come also instantly i felt like i'm a part of the team and that meant so much to me as a young player because i know so many other organizations are ran differently because i have friends that play with other organizations. And some players feel like if you're not making a certain amount of money, or if you're not playing a certain amount of time, you're not a part of the in crowd, the big name players. Yeah, you're not in the crew. You're not in the crew. And I came over there and I remember we played the Madden and that's when Deuce had his homeboys from Carolina there play. uh, We were were on the Madden and y'all boys were playing the cards, Blu-ray and things like that. I felt like, you know what, for him to feel comfortable to invite me and the rest of the young guys to be around these superstar players that I grew up watching, you know, professionally while I was in college, I got to go out and give my right and my left arm. I got, I got, I got to go out and just leave it all on the table because that meant so much to me. And I wanted to number one, let you know that that meant the world to me, my rookie year. And that's something that the Steelers organization has been built on togetherness, no, no individuals in that organization. And let me tell you that I started that when I got there, before I got there, they, they weren't doing that. Right. And I'll tell you the first group I started with when, when Joy Porter, Amos Zeraway, those guys came way much before you, um, Heinz Ward, Deshae Townsend, all those guys were, were rookies when I was there. I had them all come to my house. And and we all had Thanksgiving dinners, and we all had all, we all hung out at my place. I was single. All these guys were single, and I wanted these guys to feel like they were part of the team. I never wanted to feel as though those guys to feel as though that they weren't part of us. Because when I was a rookie with the Rams, it wasn't like that, mm-hmm. and I felt like I was on the outside. Right? It was just and, and what happened was all the rookies banded together. So mm-hmm. we was all tight, just the rookies, and then all the other guys. So we hung out with each other. We didn't know where we was going, what we were doing, because <laughs> we were rookies, right? Yeah. So it finally took one guy to open up to us and, and take us around and start showing us stuff because, you know, it, it was it was that ugly feeling, right? And so I always said to myself, when I become a veteran, I am going to include the young guys because they need us to, to, in, to incorporate them, but we also need them on the field. Exactly. So, so if, if I make them feel comfortable and well and welcoming, guess what? They gonna bust they they arm, yep. their legs, because they are part of what we're building together. So I always had guys, I always had all you guys come, and I, always, I I would have my aunt come and cook Thanksgiving dinner, and all the guys would always come, and we we would we would do the um we would go to um. Uh, we go uh, bowling. Yep, then yep, we, then yep. we would go to the um, video game place. Yep. Um, Dave and Buster's. Dave and Buster's. And yeah. so I, that was me trying to coordinate all of that because I just didn't want the defensive guys to hang out with the defensive guys mm-hmm. and the offensive guys to hang out with the offensive guys, right? Being a leader, my job was to be a part of everybody. So yep. I wanted to I wanted to be everybody's leader, right? Because if I tell you to do something, but, but you know what? He don't, he don't really hang out with us. Yeah, he don't not really, listen. He don't, well, I'm he don't kick it with us too tough. So I ain't paying attention to what he's saying. Exactly. But if I'm, you know, I play golf with the punter and kickers, right? Mm-hmm. And and, and Schneck, the, the long snapper. So I, I hung out with every group so that when it became crunch time and I and I had to tell guys, hey man, you got to get it in gear, 
there was a respect level there mm -hmm. that everybody appreciated and everybody understood and then we could take it to the next level. And so that was always me trying to include everybody. And I think it's so it's so critical because that's what makes a team special okay. and like that. Yeah. When when everybody feels that they are part of the success of that team and the organization. Well said. I definitely agree with you 110 percent in talking about being together. One thing that I realized being with you guys in Pittsburgh, the camaraderie that we had was basically established not in the facility, but away from the facility. The legendary card games before I became a Blu-ray <laughs> player my rookie year, you know, my I, I was I was so concerned about the financial concerns of losing money that I used to be <laughs> a spectator. Right. Or that's that, right. You know what I mean? Or I, you would catch me on the video games where I was more comfortable. But you, you can't got, afford it. You don't need to be in there. No question. I wasn't trying to jump in that line of fire. Mm -mm, that was too hot. But the legendary card games that I witnessed while you guys were there, especially you, man, I tell people all the time that was a part of who we were as a team. It was a part of about it wasn't about trying to win the, the most games all the time or, and talk trash or bragging rights. It was just coming together, fraternizing and having fun, but having a competitive vibe tied to it. Talk about some 100%. of the great card games that we had in Pittsburgh when you were involved. And, you know what? Boo, and Boo Ray to be Boo Ray to be specific. Boo Ray. That's right. Some of the some of the greatest Boo Ray games were when we were on the planes, right? And mm -hmm. so we would travel. And then it, it, at first it was one Boo Ray game, right? We yep. were all playing. Then it became a second offshoot Boo Ray game that was a little cheaper. Cheaper. Uh, that, was, yeah, that, was, that was a clearance Boo Ray game. That was the, the, the discount price Boo Ray game. That's why yeah. I first started it. Yeah. That's right. Because you know, so guys, was like, you know what? We can't necessarily afford that one. Uh huh. But we're going to start our own over here. It's going to be a little less violent. No question. Uh, and then we're going we gonna, to uh, get over here. And then what happened was through time, then everybody would come together. Then the Boo Ray games became huge. Huge. And the dollars were just insane. No and question. it was so much fun to because it was another way to compete against each other, right? Mm -hmm. And and the backdrop was the was the actual game, but it was the competition that you loved. And mm -hmm. we went, we go from the 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 bus right into the right into the hotel, right? Still going. Still and going. Some guys like, come on, man, I can't, I can't, I'm done, right? And and it was just, it, it was just, you just saw it. And then every Monday we would get together mm -hmm. and then we would play. And then some guys were like, I can't do that. I and it, but it was great to see that we got so many guys involved and yep. so many guys became fans of Boo. Uh, uh, and it was always, it, it was always like a, a, a show in and of itself. You see, you see him get booed. Oh. Yeah, I told you, I was the narrator. I, I saw that. I was the narrator. They used to be yeah. mad at me. I think he about to get booed. My dog just got booed. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Buzz, what was the biggest part pot you you ever been involved in in boo Ray? The biggest pot. Ooh, that's a good question. Well, in our in our Monday games, I think I had a. We had a forty thousand, a forty forty k Blu-ray game. Ooh. That that was just ridiculous. Oh. It was ridiculous. Everybody had had put some money in. It was it was out of it was out of order. Oh. I, I you don't want to get booed with it. If I don't have if I don't have Ace King of of soup, you I, 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 I'm, a, I'm not fighting. At least, my thought was I got to at least have Ace. Yeah. So I know I'm not getting booed, right? No that was my no thing because it was just like, ooh. Because you could go down there with, with four Trump and, and, and still, still get, get booed. booed. Exactly. Get booed. And you don't want to get caught in a pickle when you only got that king and you, you, should I take four? Should I take four? And you ask for four, you don't get anything or you might get that measly two or whatever the trunk is. And now you sweating bricks. And you don't know when to play. Because oh, you said, you, if, hey. if I'm playing and the ace come after me, well, I know I'm dead. Oh, I'm passing out. Please don't boo me. Push the pot. Don't boo me. Let me and, in. And, and if somebody start out with, with Trump, you're like, oh. oh so. Why are you going to do that? Don't do that. Now you're trying to boo on purpose. That's on purpose. <laughs> on purpose. You know on purpose. No doubt. No doubt. So, Speaking yeah. of the boo ray game, we had a lot of boo ray games my rookie year in 2005 that led to the championship ball game in Detroit. But before we get to your home going, to say the least, homecoming, to say the least, the divisional matchup against the Colts, 
right? Remember, we played the Colts early in the regular season. I think it was Monday Night Football and something that I'll never forget from BC Bill Cowher. He said, you know what, guys? We will be right back in this locker room in January football. Came out. We made it happen. Got right back to the RCA Dome at that time. But tell us mentally, what were, what were you thinking? What was going through your mind and your body when you had that fumble? Well, well, you're right. When, when Coach said, hey, we're going to get back because they literally they destroyed us oh, in yes. the first game yes, sir. and part of it was offensively a silent count it was so loud in there we couldn't mm -hmm. get our offense going because we couldn't hear the snap count and after that game we played in minnesota and we played the vikings and, and because the vikings had the same kind of thing because we had lost to indianapolis we developed a silent count when it was just the center with with check his head and he would snap the ball. We we invented that and now all the teams do Everybody it. Everybody does, yes. We invented that because of that Indianapolis game. And then mm -hmm. we tried it out Against in Minnesota. the Minnesota game and we got called for a penalty the first time we did it. And then we had to hit, coach called timeout to explain to the coach, the referees, really? what we were doing. Yeah, it was, this was that innovative. And so as a result, we played that game. Mm -hmm. Then all the NFL referees were on notice on that, that we were doing that. Wow. And then when we went and played Indianapolis, that's why we were so, so good because it didn't affect our offense. We were mm -hmm. on it and they were using the, 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 the noise yeah. and Freeney off the edge. Uh, it was Freeney an and advantage Matthew. because you couldn't hear. So everybody was late. Mm -hmm. But we were never laid off the snap count because we didn't use the snap count the entire game. Wow, and I didn't so, know that. That's yeah, cool. Yeah, so as a result, it was just, you know, we were dominating offensively. We did everything we wanted to do until late in the game, we get the fumble down to one. The defense was playing. You guys were playing incredible. Um, and so all of a sudden now we're on a one-yard line. I'm going in. And this is just like a formality for me because yeah. I was a clo the closer, you know, one-yard line. It, it wasn't even a question mark. And so get it, boom, get down in there. And I, I kind of turn sideways to squeeze through and boom, ball hit goes up in the air. And I tell you, it was like slow motion. Mm -hmm. It was the most painful thing you ever want to see the ball go up in the air going in. By the time I get up, He's running and, and he's zigzagging. And I see Ben turning around, running. And I'll, I'll tell you what, he made the most incredible tackle that a quarterback probably has ever made in that type of open field scenario. Uh, because he tricked the guy in the staying on the short short side of the field when he really should have should have used the field mm -hmm. to, to outrun Ben. Because Ben would have never held up if the guy just went beeline to the other sideline and just outran him. But um, no question, you know, Ben, ben just did it, made an incredible tackle and uh, it saved the day. But I mean, you had a hell of a play in the end zone uh, to knock one down uh, to uh, to get us to a, a fourth down scenario where the, where Vanderjack, he jacked it. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it was special. So I, I take my hat off to you too. You made a huge play down there in, uh, in the end zone. Hey, hey, Buzzy, real, real quick. I just didn't want to be the reason why we lost. <laughs> I, was, <laughs> I was like, That's listen, right. I'm gonna have to catch a Greyhound back, a Greyhound bus back to That's Pittsburgh right. you see that if I screw this air, thing out. Yeah, a, a but, little bit of panic coming. Oh in, my bit. goodness! Like you said, and, and people don't realize this and how true these this statement is. You don't hear anything. Like you say, when the when you fumbled the ball, everything was quiet. It was like no oh, one else was in the building. And the same for me when I saw the ball in this in the air I'm like I didn't hear anything and remember what I said earlier in our conversation about the togetherness and when you extended that invite to me I felt like I need to give my right and my left arm in battle for you guys you know what I mean you made me feel welcome and and that established respect as well you know what I mean so when it comes to championship like efforts championship teams championship companies you don't necessarily got to like and love everybody you're working with, but you got to respect them. And, and oddly for us, we all liked and loved each other along with the respect. So we had added an added bonus. That's to right. Our That's recipe right, right. for success. So I, I just, cause I never got a chance to talk to you about that play because it's funny 
when we at the goal line, like you said, we knew you were the closer. You was coming to finish the drill. We were talking so much trash to their fans because they were heckling us the first time we came and got yeah. beat up. We were talking f- trash and we were just, we weren't even looking at you guys on the field. We we selling that to their fans and instantly their fans went up and started jumping crazy, right? So we like, why they jumping for us and we just scored? Yeah, we're like, we just scored, we just scored. We looked, we saw Nick Harper, we like, oh shoot, it just got real. And we came on the field. Dick LeBeau was in a state of shock. I remember Potsy James Frazier said, Dickie, give us a call. Give us a call. He just didn't give us anything. And we're like, man, forget this. We're not losing this ball game. This is what we do. Let's boil back up. And, we, and, and we're and going to find a way to come out on top. And we did. And the rest was history. I mean, we took it. Oh, yeah. The Broncos was just easy. That was, and then, no, no. Oh, that was so easy. And then we go to Detroit, playing against Seattle. They just had that game on television, not to mention not too long ago. Uh, do you ever get a chance to rewatch that ball game? And how how was that one of the bigger moments of your career, being able to play in the Super Bowl in your hometown of Detroit? Yeah, it was it was a it was one of the huge uh, it was a huge moment. What obviously the biggest. Uh, and when I look back on that on that time, I'm so thankful that I was able to draw all of the attention away from the guys who really needed it the most. So you got Ben, who was a second year quarterback. Mm-hmm. And then um, you had Willie Parker, who was a first year starter at, at running back. And, and they didn't get bombarded with all the questions because I got bombarded with them. Right. And so it, the benefit was that they got a chance to just prepare, do their business, go about it. And, and the pressure didn't get put on them by all the questions. And so what happens is in the media, what we tend to do is we ask the same questions over and over time. Right. So yep. what that does psychologically for a player is if it's a positive question, it reinforces that, right? Because you hear it 40 times, you answer it 40 times. If it's a negative thing, it gets reinforced because now he's got to answer it. He got to justify it 40 times. Hey, I'm no, I'm not going to do that again. I'm not. Now it's in, it's, it's in your head negatively or positively. So when you don't have to deal with those questions, that do- doesn't get, you know, pushed into your thoughts. And so it was it was a big benefit that I was able to take a lot of those questions away and I wasn't going to play a major factor in the outcome of the game. So it was a big benefit for us. Wow, that's cool. That's cool insight. Definitely. For you, what was a bigger moment? What was the the biggest moment in that ball game between the two plays? Willie Parker's 75 yard touchdown run or Antoine Randall L's 43 yard touchdown pass to Heinz Ward? Well, I think the run, the run was was the one that set it up. And this was something I had saw in the game, something that they were doing. Mm-hmm. So so I'm over on the sidelines and I'm explaining to Willie, when you run this play, this is what you need to do because of what, what they were doing defensively. So I knew the play had the potential to break mm-hmm. if he didn't run, outrun it. And, I, and, and so, so many times when, when guys run a counter play, they get wide and then have to come back in. And I was explaining to Willie on the sideline and they, they show it in the game that I'm, I'm telling them, hey, listen, when we get this play, you got to stay tight, stay inside. <laughs> and when you get inside, it's going to open and it's going it, to it hit, right, hit your head on the goalpost. Yeah. And lo and behold, <clears throat> they call the play, he stay inside and it, boom, it hits right to the end zone. So that was a big moment for me because I saw it before it happened. Before it happened, yeah. and I was able to give Willie that information mm-hmm. that that created the you know to that point the longest touchdown run in NFL history. And that I mean, tells you a little bit away. about you know, like I said earlier about our team. You know, no selfish individuals. You wanted to share that information because you knew it could help Willie and and will lead to helping us in totality as a team. So that's right. I, I think that's, that's right. still the longest rushing touchdown record to date. I think so. I currently think so. 75 yards. Leading up to that ball game, the playoff run, the entire season, uh, Bill Cowher had a lot of special memories, I think, for me individually. Uh, you've been around Cowher a long time, longer than I have as a head coach. Uh, but what do you remember the most about Bill Cowher leading up to that championship run? Um, or, or, or the championship game? What I remember, what I remember was the week we're, we're about to play Chicago. Mm-hmm. We and this just lost, we just lose to um, Cincinnati. Yeah, yeah. Right? 
in high school. It, it was a devastating loss, right? Because we're like, man, now they are in control of the division, right? Because that was the one game we're like, okay, we beat them. We got still got a chance to win our division if we beat Cincinnati. We lost to Cincinnati. Now we know we're not going to win the division, right? Mm -hmm. Furthermore, if we lose one more game, we won't even have a chance to get to the playoffs. Yeah. And I remember coming in that, that Monday, coach had the board. Remember, he used to have all the stats, win, loss. He erased all of that. Yep. And he just put Chicago. And that, that was it, one game. And I just remember the mindset for us changing. Whereas we used to look week to week to week to week. No one week was bigger than the next week, right? It was just like, okay, we got to win the turnover battle in this game. And, and you looked at your progress. This, he took all that out. He like, man, none of that mattered. Yeah. The, the games forward don't matter. It's the only game that matter, right? And so that changed our mindset to the point where we became a playoff team, a one a one week team with four weeks to go. Yep. So Doing by the time we got to the playoffs, we were in our fifth playoff game. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And and so people don't realize what our mindset was because coach opened up the offense and he told he told uh Ken Wizard to run whatever you want to run. And if you remember, we ran reverses, reverse passes. The play that we went, we ran in the Super Bowl, we ran that against yeah, Cincinnati. Was it Denver? No, against Cincinnati. Cincinnati, against yeah. Cincinnati. Said, said caught that one. Said, said Wilson. caught that one. Yes. So, so we hit. So we hit, opened up the offense. Also on defense, he told, "Hey, do whatever." Mm -hmm. We got way more aggressive on defense. Yeah. Because he said, "Hey, we, I got to take my hands off. I'm gonna let you guys go." And I think that was the one thing that coach changed that made us a different football team. And real quick, talking about that Chicago game, you balled out. I mean, that was your element right there. But one thing that I will always rem remember about that game, that goal line touchdown, when you just basically ran through a handful of defenders. Ooh. I mean, and, and Brian Erlacher, great iconic linebacker, was one of the individuals you ran through. When you look at some of the outstanding runovers you've had in your career, who will probably be the best player that you've ran over in your career? Well, Erlacher was the best because he was the defensive MVP of the league that year. So yeah. he ultimately was the guy, you know what I mean? So, and we had to win that game. So that kind of propelled us to the win, which then sent us on to the, to the, to the Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. So really that moment for me is the biggest because not only did I run over defensive MVP of the league, with the number one defense, in yeah, the yeah, that defense was, was tough. At the time, they had the number; they were the number one defensive team in the NFL at the time, playing them. So, mm -hmm. with all that being said, to do that against him and for that to propel us to a championship, that's the biggest moment. Yeah, I, I like I was watching that game. I mean, watching that highlight on the sideline, it was like. This is what they mean when they call him the bus. <laughs> I was like, this is what they mean when they call him the bus. Let's transition to the current state of the Steelers, and we're going to wrap up in, 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 in a few. What are they missing, JB? What are they missing? Because we felt like at one point in time this year, being 11 and 0, um, granted, you got to get through Kansas City, the, the reigning Super Bowl champions, but we all felt like they had a shot and clearly didn't uh, live up to the expectations. What do you believe the current Steelers are missing? So let me tell you how they got to the position they're in first. Mm -hmm. They were 11 and 0. All right. But but this was the type of football team that offensively, they at the beginning of the season wanted to get the ball out of Ben's hands because he's coming off of a, a season in the injury. They didn't want to put that much on him physically because they they wanted to, they didn't want him to break down, right? They didn't want him to get beat up in the pocket. So they had all these quick passes going. Yep. And that was successful. But what happened is they never evolved the offense. Now, James Conner, when they were doing this, played well. He had a couple hundred yard games in the game. He got hurt midseason. So that's when the, the running game went down, coupled with the fact that they never evolved the offense. And so what happened was when they lost to Washington, Washington said, hey, this offense is not threatening us deep down the field. So we're going to press the receivers. We're going to stay on top of them. We're going to disrupt the short passing game, and we're going to force them 
to beat us. They can't run the football with that talented front forward that Washington had. So all of a sudden now this they struggle. So now everybody after that said, hey, just take down the short passing game. They're not throwing the ball deep. The offensive coordinator never made the adjustment mm -hmm. until the latter part of the season. And then now, you know, the last game, when you saw them play um, Cleveland, yep. the last the last regular season game, they start airing it out. Mm -hmm. And you saw big plays happening. So all of a sudden now they realize it too little too late. Yeah. Coupled with the fact that the offensive line fell apart and was not healthy at all. So when you look at the current state of where this team is, I think one, uh, obviously they've got some, some free agents that, that they've got to look at, at who they can bring back. Obviously from a cap perspective, they're, they're in some trouble. Um, but, but the quarterback position, I think here's how you have to look at Ben Roethlisberger. I think you've got to bring him back one more year. You don't have a solid replacement for Ben. Mm -hmm. Bring him back. But what you have to work on with Ben right now is it's just his fundamentals. He was out a full season. So he came back. The focus was his arm. Can he stay healthy? There was never a focus on his mechanics, on, on his footwork you know on the basics so now you go back to the basics establish his accuracy again because i think that's what ben lost fell apart with his accuracy establish the accuracy again you, he still can throw the ball down the field we saw that and now you draft a quarterback in this mm -hmm. draft you have dwayne haskins you uh, you also have um uh the other rudolph. kid mason rudolph, uh, mason rudolph yep. right so now you've got these guys with the young guy, you bring these three quarterbacks in, let them sit behind a championship quarterback, mm -hmm. see how he prepares, see how he um, practices, right? See how he gets ready in preparation for this season. Now, after the season's over, you give these three guys an opportunity to play who's going to be the next starting quarterback and let them, let them decide and camp. When you look at free agency, Who's more likely to return to Pittsburgh in 2021? Juju Smith-Schuster, James Conner? Oh, great question. Um, I think James Conner in, in, in more, uh, well, possibly. Here's, here's the problem with James Conner. The problem is they have some running backs that they think are, are adequate, so they may not be willing to pay a, a a not overly priced price mm -hmm. they may just say you know what uh i think we can survive you know at the running back position but i think james connor is the best running back of all of them mm -hmm. so if you do if, if you're going to look to bring him back i think you should now well, with that being said they may say you know what we can get we got more value we can draft another one and, and do the course of these three or four we can get enough in the running game they may say that because juju may be more of a priority i think i think juju is really the the really the band-aid if you will on that in that group he does it all yep. he's the heinz ward of this group he he does great job blocking he does all the unselfish things and he goes out there and does his job at a high level now the question is where, where what is his price tag Exactly. It's going to be too much, right? No, it'll be higher than James. It's going to be higher than James. But yeah. but I'll say the one player that they need to bring back more than anybody else on the team is Bud Dupree. I thought Bud Dupree was the difference maker. When he went out, that defense was never the same. The same. And I knew that they lost the uh, they weren't championship caliber anymore at I that agree. point. So I thought I think D Bud Dupree should be the number one priority. Uh, obviously, he's coming off of an ACL, but I, I would address a Bud Dupree. You can't necessarily pay him the blockbuster numbers that that, that position would ask for. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that becomes the issue. Is Will he become overpriced because of the position and how he fared before the injury? That's the challenge. No, no question. I, I, Bud Dupree really earned a lot of leverage when he was injured.
<laughs> not being in the lineup because, like you said, the defense was not the same when they didn't have the duo rushing pass rushers and Watt and Dupree. Now we're almost at the end of our show. Uh, it's time to wrap up with our superlatives. And here's where I hit you with a rapid-fire questions. Once you're unbiased, okay. honest answer. Uh, first question, greatest running back performance in Super Bowl history. Performance? Hmm. I might have to go with Marcus Allen. Mm-hmm. Against the Redskins. Against the Redskins. Yeah, yeah. Also, too, you can throw, you could throw in uh, another Washington football club player in Timmy Smith. Uh, but yeah, Super Bowl yeah, 18 yeah. was Marcus Allen. Because he had Allen. a record. I think he got the most yards. Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, Marcus Allen. Ooh, this is a good one. Ha <laughs> ha. Mount Rushmore of Steeler players, all of the greats who have played in a Super Bowl. Joe Green. Mm-hmm. One. Yep. Um, Franco, two. Yep. Bradshaw, three. Mm-hmm. One more. How many are we going Mount Rushmore? Four or five? We just, we just going four. Rushmore. We got to make it tough for I you. Need <laughs> I need five. I need five. You got to make four. <laughs> and Mel Blunt. Ooh. So you got you got, got me Mel though. over Lynn Swan. Unfortunately, that's a tough. That's a tough, tough, tough one. Why did you Why did you go uh uh Mel over Lynn? Because they changed the rules because of Mel Blunt. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. And the thing about this question, when when regarding Steelers, there's no wrong answer. I mean, you can have five different packs of fours <laughs> and still be okay with it. But you went Joe Green, Terry. Mel and Franco. It, it, and, and, you know, and you look at who I'm leaving out. You're leaving I'm out leaving, some greats. <laughs> look at the linebackers I'm leaving out. Yeah. What about any of the current guys or, or, or guys that you played with? Troy. Now, so here's the thing. Here's the thing. Hold on. Yourself. Here's, here's the, the Mount Rushmore of, of, of the players I played with. Okay. Let me hear that one. Let me hear that. The players, that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the Mount Rushmore players I played with. Yeah, boy, that's this is a good one too. <laughs> I'm exclude myself. Okay, that's fair. Myself. that's fair. That's fair. That's fair. Exclude myself because I need more space. I need yeah. more space. One would be Damani Dawson. One. Oh, well respected, was, but under the radar. The, Doesn't Demani get Damani Dawson to was I arguably the great, the best center ever to play in the NFL. Mm -hmm. People don't, don't know how great he was. He's one of the greatest to ever play. Okay? And technically, you could say the Steelers organizations have probably had the best centers to ever play in Dawson and Webster. That's right. That's right. And and Dawson, he he was he pulled on the sweet plays. When that the, wasn't a thing back that then. Was never a thing. He was exactly. the first one to ever do it. So, yeah. okay. So, Dawson? Dawson? <laughs> okay, that's two. Greg Lloyd. <laughs> he is, oh, Greg Lloyd's grown man. Greg Lloyd. One more. <laughs> one more. This is a tough one mm -hmm. because it's between Heinz Ward and Alan Fanica. Oh, Big Red. <laughs> That's what's right there. <laughs> hey, both was hell, right? Ooh, oh, both man, of those man. guys were here. Oh, and you know this should be this should be Allen's year to go in the Hall of Fame. I yeah. believe he's going in. Um, but that that's a tough one. I, I would chisel half their face on each on that one piece. Mm -hmm. You got to pick one. Who you taking? You taking Big Red? One, man. You taking Big Red or Heinz? <laughs> you play with some great guys though, JB. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you what, man. I play uh -huh. some hell of a players, man. Okay. And I'm, you know, and I'm leaving some out. Yeah, you're leaving a lot out. Because I played with Rod Woodson for one year, and he mm -hmm. he he would probably be on there, but I only played with him for one year. One year. Now, I mean, he probably got to be on there in front of. Um, he he'd be definitely be on front of of these guys, but no, 
I'm just saying I just played one year, so I'm discounting that just yeah. because, right? I mean, but, you got but, Casey Ron Hampton Wilson was up there. Carnell Lake was Carnell up there. Lake, um, Casey Hampton, Casey Hampton. <laughs> I mean, people don't how don't know how great Casey Hampton was, man. Yeah, at his position, he's one of the best that ever did it. At okay. nose guard, man, how he, he was just sensational. Yeah, uh, so. And he doesn't get the credit that he deserves. Exactly. Um, I mean, just some outstanding football players. Oh, you said uh, Alan Fanica and Hines. You you don't know which one you can go man, with. Man, leave me alone, man. Why are you pressing, man? That's that media stuff that you do, doing, man. That's that media yeah, stuff. You, hey, you're not going to let me out the hook. No, sir. No, sir. That's trifling, you've been, man. I'm hey, you've been picking up blitzes all your life. You okay with it. You can pick that's up that blitz. That's trifling. Blitz. I'm just telling you, that's <laughs> trifling. I got an okay. easy one for you there. Okay, well, would you go, go ahead? Be, because I went with the office alignment and Damani Dawson, I'm not gonna put two office alignment on there. Okay. I'm gonna go with Heinz Ward as two off, two offensive guys and mm -hmm. two defensive guys. That's how uh -huh. I'm gonna solve it. That's acceptable. But that uh, yeah. Damani Dawson, man, he, man, special. special. Incredible. This is an easy one for you. Favorite Super Bowl snack? I'm going with Tostitos with the um, Tostitos with the uh, salsa. Ooh, you like the, oh, you don't like the queso? I do like the queso, but the the, the salsa just is is a little, little boom. I, I just knock that out so much yeah. easier. I love the queso too. Now, don't get me wrong. Queso, I'm gonna tell you I what I do. The queso up though a little bit. I mix I mix it a little bit. I get a little bit of salsa and queso all on it all on the chip. Yes, mm, that's, that's gang heaven. Gang. That's, gang that's gang. Gang. Try that this and, Sunday. And, and I just, I was just in a, towards the night before the Super Bowl commercial that just, they just launched it mm -hmm. uh, today. And uh, it airs, it airs on uh, Super Bowl Sunday. Okay. And in the commercial, it's great because it's, 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 I mean, iconic group of, of players, right? Mm -hmm. You've got me and Terry Bradshaw talking about the immaculate reception, right? Uh -huh. But we're talking about it from the receiver perspective, right? And I, I'm telling him how hard it was to catch. It was at his ankles, right? And he's like, ah, I'm, he, and so we we reenact the actual play. I mean, it's just crazy. So wow. it's that kind of stuff. And then Troy Aikman is trying to get cool with Joe Montana and Jay Rice, and uh -huh. he's trying to be the third leg. You know, <laughs> it, it's just, it's a it's a great oh, commercial when you so see we, it. So we just got a sneak peek on a, one of the biggest yeah. commercials this upcoming Sunday. All you things coming from Jerome Betty. Uh -huh. That's what's up on CBS, by the way, on CBS. Last question for you. Super Bowl prediction. Whew. Now, B.A., uh, Bruce Arians, mm -hmm. coach with us in Pittsburgh, so I got an affinity for him. I'm rooting for him yes, sir. to win his first one. It's just like I was rooting for Andy Reid last year to win his first one. Um, mm -hmm. So I won't be able to win. Uh, I just – I'm scared of Kansas City, man. That that offense is so Prolific. dangerous, especially when you blitz them. Mm -hmm. So so Tampa likes to, to, to get after the quarterback – the problem is, are you going to leave Travis Kelsey one on one? Tariq Hill. Are you going to leave um, Tariq Hill one on one? You can't afford to. You can't. No. So the one player I think is going to be pivotal is Sammy Watkins. Yeah. Because he's going to be the guy that he going to get the third best guy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and he's a stud himself. Yeah, Sammy and Watkins. He's been out three or four weeks, so he's going to be fresh. Yep. I mean, I'm just saying it's 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 a challenge, but I'm I'm rooting for I'm rooting for Tampa though. I'm rooting for Tampa. Rooting for Tampa, Tampa but your heart realistically, is Tampa. yeah, Kansas City. If I'm if I'm betting, I you would bet Kansas, Kansas City, City, but my yeah. heart is rooting for, for Tampa. And that and line I, is three. And I've, yeah, and I've become um uh more respectful uh, and more appreciative of Tom Brady. Mm. Um obviously as a competitor you look at somebody in a different light. Mm -hmm. And so now not being this comp not being a competitor, being on the sidelines watching, I have a pre come to appreciate uh his greatness a lot more. You know, sometimes you you lose a game, you know, it's a bad beat. We're yeah. the better team. Da -da -da -da. You're right. But now when you see what he's able, what he's accomplished throughout his the totality of his career, 
Um, mm -hmm. You have to take your, your 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 cap off to this man and acknowledge him as one of the baddest men to ever do it in the game. It's ever, ever. right? In all and professional sports. That's right. That's right. So uh, it it took me a while to get there. Obviously, you you take losses hard, and you com your competitors. You like man, you don't want to give them an inch, but I got to give him a mile because he's earned it. He's deserving of it. No question. Uh, deserving of it. People call okay. him the goat. I used to always cringe when I hear. Ah. Right. But now you kind of accept it. I, I no, I acknowledge it. Yes, sir. Yeah, yes, you sir. accept it, but do you acknowledge, acknowledge it? it? Yeah, I I acknowledge that. And when you acknowledge it, it's going to a, that's a higher standard. It's a higher standard. Yes, Absolutely. sir. No question. Hey, awesome conversation here on this special Super Bowl edition. Jerome Bettis joining us. Before we let you go. Heard about the foundation, the bus stops here. Is there anything else you would like to pub or you want to talk a little bit more? Give us a little more insight about that current uh, uh, situation you have going on with the foundation. So so with the foundation, we, we kind of took a pivot, obviously, when COVID-19 hit. Uh, and we we tried to figure out what, what could we do to best serve the communities that we are impacting. And what we found is that um, there's there's a there's so many kids out here that don't have access to um the digital devices that's needed uh, right now in, in what in, in this pandemic that we're dealing with. So what we started to do is we started to raise money to, to provide laptops for kids, and, and then we also want to provide the access to the internet. Right? They need to be accessible uh, and, and to reach all of that. So we we started that outreach. We we bought over a thousand computers. Uh, laptops that we've been able to provide to kids and, and all those things that we're trying to do. So um, with anyone out there listening, we'd love to help, interested in any aspect of this. Now, all I do is uh, go to the bus stops here, foundation.org uh, and get involved. I appreciate it. Okay. There you have it. Listeners and viewers, man, make sure you get go out and, and show the bus and his foundation, some love, you know, that's positivity. Uh, that's have some positive things that's happening right now from a positive individual in his foundation, man. Once again, man, it's a pleasure you joining us here. All things covered. Brian B. Fat and Patrick Peterson, man, Hall of Famer and Super Bowl champion and newly inspired actor. Because he got a big time commercial <laughs> coming out this upcoming Super Bowl Sunday on CBS with them, some other Iconic NFL personalities as well be joining Jerome Bettis on that commercial. So make sure you check him out. And also he gave you his favorite Super Bowl snack. Go out and get some uh, some some Tostitos, to say the least, uh, and make sure you get the, the, the salsa as well. Appreciate you joining us. Thank you, brother. Appreciate it, bro. Be back. Yes, sir. Bro.